again. Um, my name is George Marshall, if you didn't catch it before. Um, I'm one of the elders here at the Mount, and I'm excited to, to bring you a word of exhortation from the scripture today. Um, much like Brian, um, I believe the sea to be a dark and forbidding representation of chaos itself. But unlike Brian, who we learned last week has decked his house for Christmas before the Thanksgiving bird is even out of the store, I won't be decking my house for Christmas until the last moment, if I can help it. Don't worry, Kim will ensure it happens well before that. I would probably banish Christmas music and all the other festivities until Christmas Day itself, as the church intended. <laughs> but I could probably start celebrating Advent in May, right after Easter, because it's such a rich idea. Um, <laughs> it's pregnant with possibilities, quite literally. For starters, uh, there's the sovereignty of God over his people, over all nations, and over all of creation. Then there's his concern for the, the poor, the exile, the rejected, the childless, the widow. Advent is steeped in remembering God's faithfulness to his people, his faithfulness to David, his faithfulness to Abraham. Advent addresses the incarnation, the trinity, sinners' desperate need. We get a taste of Jesus coming to proclaim the kingdom and his second coming to restore all things, things we wait for. There's also judgment on mankind for our rejection of God's order, judgment on Israel for faithlessness, the making of a new Israel, and the coming, that, the coming kingdom that fulfills all God's plans for eternal relationship with us, his holy people. It's a truly rich place to find, one, find oneself uh, dealing with themes of suffering, of waiting, of patience, of endurance, of godliness, humility, submission, forgiveness, eternality, purpose, design, <laughs> so much, perseverance. Today, as we look at Psalm 102, we're, we're going to get just a glimpse um, as we inch our way closer to Advent. So let's read in Psalm 102. The psalmist says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and is withered. I forget to eat my bread because of my loud groaning. My bones cling to my flesh. I'm like a desert owl in the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I'm like a lonely sparrow in the housetop. All the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse, for I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. Because of your indignation and anger, for you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O oh Lord, are enthroned forever. You're remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It's the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity even on her dust. Nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. Let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That he looked down from his holy height, from heaven the Lord looked at the earth. To hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die. That they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem his praise. When peoples gather together, and kingdoms to worship the Lord. He's broken my strength in mid-course. He's shortened my days. Oh my God, I say, T take not away in the midst of my days. Take me not away. You whose years endure throughout all generations. Of old, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, 
and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words to us. Words that heal, words that strengthen failing hands. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? Holy wrath is not the last word because you delight in steadfast love. You have compassion on us. You tread our iniquities underfoot. You've cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You've shown faithfulness to Jacob, steadfast love to Abraham, grace and mercy to us, as you swore from days of old. Hear us, Jesus. Send your spirit to teach and to comfort. Amen. So the title of the psalm reads, A Prayer of One Afflicted When He Is Faint and Pours Out His Complaint Before the Lord. Taken as a whole, uh, it signals hope to every one of God's people as they near the end of their own endurance. It offers a, a bigger world than the confines of the life, this life, and sets us on a trajectory where we are known, beloved, and precious. It begins with an answer um, to the isolation that's caused by suffering. That's something that's sorely needed right now. So we're going to take some time to really dig into it. While initially a psalm of, of private grief, personal grief, it quickly turns to an awareness that God is at work with an unbelievably comprehensive plan that makes our momentary concerns pale in comparison. But it pulls no punches. Just like the psalmist, we often feel that God is moving at a glacial pace. This psalm speaks directly to us, telling us to rest in God's timing. Just as the nation of Israel looked to this psalm for comfort as they waited for God to gather his people in Jerusalem, we wait expectantly for Christ to return, lavishing us in mercy. Not what we deserve, but mercy. Vindicating our faith, no matter what it has cost us. It ends with a bursting heart declaring the, confidently that God is able to hold his own securely. He doesn't let us go. So let's take it bit by bit and, and listen for God to speak. It starts in verse 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Don't hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. In the first lines of this psalm, we get to, to listen in as the psalmist cries out to God. The cry is, hear me, God. Respond, I need you here, right now, come, come in close. In just a moment, the psalmist will paint for us a picture of his suffering. But it begins with just this sense of isolation, that nobody's listening. A need to be known by God for him to, to be present. Even before we get into the meat of the psalmist's grief, you can sense this suffering cry of Job. The need we'll see on Jesus' lips in the garden. Do you feel it? Can you put yourself in the psalmist's place? God, are you listening? Do you see what goes on down here? Do you see the wicked? Do you see my pain? Do you see what sin has ruined? What it's continuing to ruin? Are you really doing something about it? I don't have anyone else to turn to, God. An important truth before we move even one step further is that we're never quite as alone as we think we are. The psalmist cries out to God to hear, but, but he isn't alone. David, Psalm 39, 12, weeps, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. Asaph implores, O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? The sons of Korah sing, O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to hear my cry. God longs for us to join in this throng who cry out to him, 
to recognize their deep need for him before all other things. We sang, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. That's what we read. But seek first. As God's faithful people, we're never really alone. This cry to God unites, in a sense, God's people over time and over space. And that's not just heady hyperbole. That's, that's real. It connects us. It sets us in good company as we share in the suffering of Christ recorded in Matthew 27, 46. Eli, Eli, lema My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right from the lips of Jesus, this same cry. In verse 3, um, the psalmist continues, giving color to his personal grief. He says, For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and is withered. I forget to eat my bread. Be because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh, and I'm like a desert owl in the wilderness. Like an owl of the waste places, I lie awake. I'm like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink because of your indignation and anger. For you've taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. If you had not picked up the Job-likeness in the first couple verses, I believe you hear it now. Groaning, near death, spoken ill of, wasting away. Uh, it may be hard for some of us to relate because we are so richly blessed in this country. But we're still human. Even, even if we aren't personally experiencing all of the anguish of the psalmist, we know of friends who are struggling with disease and illness. A family member near death, a, a friend grieving the loss of a loved one, a brother or sister treated unjustly. Neighbors who are struggling to make it to the next day and trying to stay above water. Grief over evil that seems part and parcel of the world we inhabit. The Psalms, uh, including this one, beg us to do more than just listen in. Uh, they beg us to take part in prayers of lament and, and songs of praise and thanksgiving. We're meant to do more than read and think, hmm, that's interesting. We're meant to go, y yes, I can relate to that God. Y you really want me to praise? Okay, I can do that. We're meant to, to share encouragements, to come and worship in the presence of the king. And, and with this psalm, it calls on us to share our grief with God in honest prayer. So the question is, are we prayers? Not just assenting to the benefits of prayer. Not just agreeing that Jesus commands his people to do it and expects them to be eager to do it. But do we actually do it? And do we take our personal grief to God? Or is it something we share with friends but keep locked away from God's ears? I just don't want to hear that. Is it something we try to bear alone, shouldering a weight God never intended us to? As we think of Advent and we consider what it looked like to wait for God to restore the glory of Israel, we have to imagine a lot of tearful nights. And thank God we have the Spirit to give us hope but we're not immune to suffering either. Even so, Christ is coming. Amen? Amen. But this world is full of sin. Uh, our own spirits are at war with our bodies. I mean, we have to daily struggle against sin. It's a war. The mission is not easy. It's emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausting. More so if we're doing it without prayer and in our own strength. We're meant to take the example of the psalmist seriously, just as we take the example of Christ seriously. So pray, brothers and sisters. That's what I want you to get from all of this. Pray. Make it a priority. Pray alone. Pray with your families. Pray with your roommates. Pray as a gathered church. Find opportunities to pray. Make it a real, present reality in your life to really communicate with this God who loves us so much. Turning to verse 12, we read, But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You're remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. 
nations will fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. But you, O oh Lord, makes a dramatic shift. What was personal is now corporate and communal. Personal grief is replaced with the truth of God's character and promises. God is enthroned forever. He's timeless. He's a faithful covenant partner. He said he would restore Zion, and he will. The psalmist could have responded with cynicism or bitterness. We often do. God is eternal, and what good does that do me in the moment? But that isn't the response of faith, and it isn't what the, the, the psalmist does. Rather than complain that God is moving slowly, he glories in the fact that God is not done. God's not done. Though his purposes reach uh, far into the future, glorious, majestic, they still reach in and, and touch our lives right now. So look at verse 13. It says, you'll arise and have pity on Zion. It's the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. Uh, one commentator writes, man's urgency and God's measured pace are both insisting the same thing, that there's no time to waste. God is not slow to act for his people. He's putting everything in perfect order to accomplish his purposes. He's demonstrating his boundless mercy and grace. He's not being slow. The psalmist speaks of holding the stones dear, of having pity on her dust. These probably remind us of, of better times, you know, kind of looking at past glories. Uh, but they also remind us of failure, failure that led this people uh, to the temple's destruction, that led to the loss of God's glory inhabiting their presence, of exile in a foreign country. Uh, we look back to former glories, bygone days that are fondly remembered when we saw God move strongly. We recall the stories of those who went before us and asked if it's our time. God doesn't give us a moment to dwell on revenge or recovery or our glory. Rushing on to verse 15, nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. God will absolutely be true to his promises to Abraham, to Moses, to David. We've moved from personal grief to the sure promises of God. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory, the psalmist continues. The God you're crying out to hear you, he shows up. Just like he said he would, he regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. God's care for the outcast, the destitute, the despised, is what Luke has in mind when he records Mary's song of praise. In Luke, he says... My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation, timeless again. He has shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he's sent away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And God doesn't forget. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Destitution is met with mercy. The humble prayers are heard and not despised. He brings the power of the world to nothing and exalts exactly whoever he will. The writer to the Hebrews opens with, Long ago, in many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us with his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. God himself is coming 
in the person of Jesus. There's an answer for you, psalmist. Yes, yes, yes. God will show up. He'll restore Zion. He will judge his people. and He will judge the nations. He will do it all. But he doesn't stop there. He says, if, if that were all there were to it, we, we should have enough reason to proclaim the glories of God. But he's not only faithful, his plans are bigger. And we, we see in verse 18, he, he writes, Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That he looked down from his holy height, from heaven the Lord looked at the earth, to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem his praise when peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord. In other words, psalmist, God will not be content to restore Jerusalem to its previous glory. Those days are over. What you long for, God is doing so much more. Zion's reach is greater than you could ever have imagined. God will absolutely be true to his promises, promises to Abraham, true to his promises to David. But when God is done, it won't just be the nation of Israel praising God. So let's take a moment to detour. Exodus 15, um, it won't be up there, but you can, you can look, but I'll, I'll be reading it. Um, Exodus 15 holds a song of praise. You may not be familiar with it. it it's called the Song of Moses. And it's offered to God after he's rescued his people from Egypt. Um, and so I'm going to read it to you. I won't attempt to sing it as I'm not really sure how the tune goes, um, but we'll, we'll read it. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he's thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the hearts of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who, who's like you, majestic in holiness? awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You've led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You've guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The people have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of thy, uh, the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. So who's like him? Uh, for there's no other God. He leads the redeemed people with steadfast love. He guides them by his strength. The people hear and they tremble. His redeemed walk by their enemies in safety. He will bring them to Zion. That's the mountain. That's the abode. So we see this overlap between the Song of Moses and Psalm 102. He reigns forever. They both highlight this, this aspect of God. The, the surety of his promises because he's eternal. He's timeless. This morning's psalm combines that redeeming and victorious power of God with God's promises to David. But even described that way, Psalm 102 points beyond. It points to something bigger. It sees the prisoner freed and rescue for the hopeless. It sees the nations not just vanquished, 
as in the Song of, Mo uh, the, the, the Song of Moses, but included in his program. Gathered to Jerusalem to worship as one people. It gazes into the distant future that we find in Revelation 15. And there we see, we, we see John write, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Who's like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who's like you, majestic in holiness? Who is like you, willing to take on flesh and dwell among your people? Who else would voluntarily endure the unjust attacks of evil men and a cursed death to redeem confirmed enemies? Who else would shed his own blood to pay the penalty of sin? Who else could stand in the heavenly throne room and declare you righteous? Great and amazing are your deeds indeed, O Lord God Almighty. This is the culmination of what Peter speaks about in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. He says, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Psalm 102 looks ahead to the new Israel, the restored people of God. Not just Israel and its kings, not just Gentiles offered salvation, but a new nation, holy before the Lord. That's us. That's what the church is intended to be. The early church really struggled with this idea of a new people, made out of both Jew and Gentile. Uh, just read Acts or Galatians or Romans and you can kind of see what they struggled with. And most of our churches don't actually struggle uh, with this problem, on its face at least. You know, we don't really talk about, you know, are we accepting of Jews, are we accepting of Gentiles? We don't deal with that. But it doesn't mean we're immune. Uh, the Jews consider the Gentiles to be uh, the worst of the worst, undeserving of God's mercy. Do we act as if some are unworthy of the gospel? That's essentially the same idea. So as we read Psalm 102, we're challenged to see the end from God's vantage point. A new people created from even those we once thought beyond hope. The end of the psalm briefly returns to the grief of verses 1 through 11. Uh, but this enables us to really uh, see the end shout. So he says, he's broken my strength in mid-course. He's shortened my days. Oh my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my days, you whose years endure throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You'll change them like a robe, and they'll pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servant shall dwell secure, their offspring shall be established before you. The psalmist says, remember that my life is short and yours is eternal. It's a gasp. But he has no reason to fear, and neither do we. The future rests on God's unending nature and not on the short lives we live. They don't depend on us. The grief of this life is, is momentary. And as I said earlier, it, it pales in comparison, as Scripture says, to the glories God has in store for us. That's not to say they aren't real, that they aren't painful, that they don't cause us to doubt, uh, that they don't cause us to lose heart at times. But in perspective, they're small potatoes compared to all that God has planned. In speaking of Jesus' greatness, the, writers, uh, the writer of Hebrews quotes verses 25 through 27 there. Of old, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. 
You will change them like a robe and they will pass away, but you are the same and your years have no end. It probably sits behind Hebrews 13, 8 as well. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And in case you miss it there, if anybody ever tells you the scripture doesn't talk about Jesus in such exalted ways, that's a, a later thing of the church. It's not. I mean, they just took a psalm about God and said, that's Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. He's the king. So God, the creator, the one who laid the foundation of the earth is the Jesus we meet in scripture. And because he's eternal, we can dwell secure. We've been established before God. As Romans wonders, who or what could possibly stand against the purpose of God? The grief of the psalmist um, of the nation of Israel is but a few days in God's timeline. Psalm 102 is like um, an ultrasound. Months lay ahead, but the end is a beautiful, bouncing baby. Morning sickness, the baby kicking and stretching, baby name picking, uh, baby showers with family and friends, dietary changes, food cravings, and finally labor pains. They're all in the future, but they're received with anticipation and hope as God rolls out his plan. As followers of Jesus, we're blessed to have so much of God's plan revealed, more than the psalmist could understand. But we too have to wait eagerly expecting Christ to return. That return promises vindication for all our suffering. It promises joy that is unending. Not just momentary. Not just my team won. Unending joy. It promises peace in the presence of God himself who truly loves us. So, unbelieving friend, God's promises are dependable. They go so far beyond being dependable. Uh, Jesus, the one who is the ultimate speaker in this psalm, the one who suffered, uh, the one who died and was raised again, the one who sent the Spirit to create this new people we've been talking about, is able to save you. Repent of your sin. Your efforts to find happiness and meaning in your own effort, let them go. Take the easy yoke of Jesus and find true rest and peace, eternal relationship with the God who fashioned the universe and spoke your very life into being. And brothers, uh, sisters, this morning, um, this morning's passage reminds us uh, that God has gone to amazing lengths to create a people where before there was nothing. Nothing. And we had no hope on our own. We were dead in our sins. So what? Persevere. Don't give up. Demonstrate your faith in obedience to Christ. That's not contrary to grace. That's responding to grace. Cling to him before you cling to any other thing that brings you comfort and security. All your hope rests in him. Cry out to him. Cry out to him before you cry at your neighbor. Let him know your pain, your joy, your frustration, and your hope. Pray for your brothers and your sisters in Christ that they might be faithful too. That they would resist sin. That they would respond in love when the world offers hate. Uh, sing songs of joy to the Lord. Quite honestly, sing to one another. Not right now. In a moment. You're going to sing in heaven. That's kind of the picture we get. So you might as well practice here and now. So learn some good songs that sing of God's praises and share them with each other. Your allegiance ultimately is new. You're not your own. You aren't defined by where you came from or what you've experienced. You aren't defined by your prior sin. You aren't under its authority any longer. So don't let it control you. Instead, with First Peter, proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. You're an ambassador for the king of the universe. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, work out your salvation so that you reflect his image more and more clearly. And love. Love one another genuinely as Christ has loved you. Let's pray. 
Father, we, we don't always know what we ought to pray, uh, but we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the love of Christ displayed in your coming. Jesus, we've, we've tasted of your mercy and grace. We, we trust in it alone as we wait for your glorious return. Jesus, we ask you to build your church. Send us in the Holy Spirit to our families, our co-workers, our neighbors, our enemies. Turn enemies into friends, into brothers and sisters. Be glorified by the worship and praise of your people now and forever. Come, Lord Jesus, in your time and according to your will. Amen.